Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski. I will be your host for today. And it's been a pretty awesome February for us so far. This month, we've been featuring amazing women in science, adventure, exploration, and conservation. We've had a whole bunch of really cool events you can check out uh, on YouTube, and we have even more coming uh, in the next uh, few weeks. But things just keep getting better. Right now, I'm with Jamina Garland-Lewis. She's a National Geographic Young Explorer. Her most recent work focused on documenting the stories and images of the last living former whalers in the Azores. She's a photographer, a biologist, and explorer. And she has a background in conservation biology, global health, and documentary storytelling. Her adventures have taken her to 29 countries uh, on six continents. And both her research and photography explore the many connections between humans, animals, and our shared environment. So Jamina, it's so great to have you joining us for another Explorer Classroom today. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and thank you to all of the classrooms that I see here on camera that are joining in elsewhere. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of this event. I think it's just so cool what's, uh, what's happening this month. And I'm honored to be uh, one of the many amazing women who are sharing their work and their lives with you this month. So um, thank you for that and welcome. Um, and yeah, so uh, like Jeff said, my name is Jamina Garland Lewis, and I am a photographer, a writer, outdoor adventurer, National Geographic explorer, eco health researcher. Um, it's a lot of things, I know, um, but really what it does boil down to is that uh, I look at this connection between humans, animals, and our shared environment. Um, and I do that through my photography and, and my work as a scientist. And so um, today, I will share with you guys a little bit about uh, what that actually means, what some of the projects I've worked on are, and a little bit of um, my story, how I got to where I am today with that. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this screen share here. Um, all right, can you guys see that? We got it. Perfect. All right, so uh, this is me as a little girl, probably a little bit younger than a, a number of you guys. Um, but I was really fortunate to have parents who really uh, gave me uh, an, an upbringing and a childhood in the outdoors and who got me outside camping and backpacking and hiking. Um, and just really that's where my, my curiosity about outdoor adventure um, started and where I got used to being dirty and uh, outside and wanting to uh, to explore and uh, that's something that just built for me over time that relationship with the outdoors and with being outside um, and in high school is where I really first started doing photography and having that be a part of my experience with the outdoors and part of that relationship that I was building with the outdoors and getting to share my experience with other people. Um, and uh, still today going strong with that, um, the outdoors is a really important part of my life, um, both in my work and uh, in general. Um, and so this relationship has sort of been the foundation for for my work and in, in, in experiencing this type of relationship we can have with the outdoors with our environment we sometimes call it the nature fix um, the ways that it benefits our mental health our physical health um, and these are stories that i want to share i want to share um because this is it's not just me there's lots of people um that have these relationships and they're really it's just something unique um and sharing these can help protect some of these places so that uh, kids like you guys as you grow up or as you have kids these places are still there to have that experience with um, because there's really there's nothing quite as amazing as uh, waking up in a tent in the mountains and having volcanoes all around you um, and these kinds of experiences are all things that have really impacted me and things that I, I want to share um, and so coming from this background sort of understanding that relationship that we can have with our environment um, there are a couple things around college that really started to to push me a step further in the way that I was thinking about these relationships. Um, 
And the first of those was uh, classes that started to talk to me about um, the relationship between people, animals, and the environment in terms of disease, in terms of health and disease and how that could impact conservation. And so I actually got to start working on projects um, that happened in, in East Africa where there are mountain gorillas, which are a critically endangered species. Um, and the role that human health actually played in the success of conservation strategies for these gorillas. And I, I had known before that there were some diseases that uh, were able to be transmitted between uh, people and animals, things like rabies, I think, you know, is, is one that a lot of people know about. Um, but I didn't realize until then sort of just how extensive it was. You know, the majority of diseases that we see sort of as new or um, coming back today, emerging and re-emerging is what we call them. Um, uh, they're actually, the majority of them are able to be transmitted between people and animals. So it's, it's actually a, a whole lot of them. And um, the other interesting thing about this to me was um, sometimes there's a tendency to think about it in terms of uh, animals can make people sick but it can also go the other way. And that's the issue that we saw here with the mountain gorillas is that the human health um, and disease in human communities that surrounded the parks where the mountain gorilla live uh, was impacting mountain gorilla health and that humans, if they were sick, were passing on their diseases. So if you had like a stomach bug or you had a flu or something, gorillas are close enough to us, uh, close enough related that um, they can pick up those diseases pretty easily. Um, and they can get really sick from them. And so uh, I got to work on a team that was doing the first uh, really integrated approach that I had experienced. You know, we, sometimes we wanna talk about human health in, in one area, we wanna talk about uh, wildlife conservation in another, and maybe the forest in a different one. And these people are all talking to each other, but not, or excuse me, they're all talking uh, within their own circles, but not necessarily talking to each other in those different areas. And so um, the group that I worked with was working to improve human health, um, which is something we want to do anyway, right? Um, but they were doing it to improve mountain gorilla conservation. Because if the humans are healthier, then the gorillas won't get as sick. And that means there's more gorillas. Um, and then that means that there uh, can maybe be more money coming in through tourism to help develop some of these areas, but also put more money into conservation and national parks uh, in the country and in the region. And so. Um, this really opened my mind to seeing ways that um, if you just sort of thought outside the box and thought more integrated and really realized that we are, hey, we're all connected, we all live here together, um, that you could design something um, and work um, across disciplines and make, make a, a strategy that was good for everybody. Um, and the next thing that really sort of pushed me further with this was a fellowship that I was fortunate to get after college. Um, and this brought me to seven different countries um, and over the course of a year um, to do a project that I had proposed. Um, and it was, I wanted to explore more deeply the different types of relationships formed with a specific uh, type of animal, so with whales, because whales were something that I uh, really cared about um, and that I could see that people had sort of formed different different types of cultural relationships with in different parts of the world, and I wanted to explore that. So um, I traveled around the world for a year by myself um, doing this work, and I was in Portugal, South Africa, New Zealand, Tonga, Japan, Norway, and Argentina. Um, and I was exploring sort of what what are these different ways that people connect to these animals. Um, and so in some ways that was working with whalers. So people who either used to hunt whales or who currently were hunting whales, um, whether they were doing it for food or for money or for both. Um, I worked with whale biologists, people who are scientists who are uh, studying these incredible animals and pushing what we know about them forward. Uh, I worked with whale watching companies, uh, sort of looking in some places at this transition um, <clears throat> and an economy maybe that had really been dependent upon whaling and that shift now to whale watching, um, but how the whale was still the focus. Um, and then in some places where those two things were happening side by side. And then also sometimes it, it took a more form of uh, spiritual or religious connection. Some of the indigenous, indigenous communities I worked with in New Zealand um, whales are a really important part of the, not only their creation stories, but how they practice their culture today. Um, and so 
while my work in uh, and with the mountain gorillas was really sort of focused more in, in the hard science and in disease, this year allowed me to sort of explore more um, about the cultural side and the cultural relationships we form with the type of animal. Um, and that's also really important because if you want to talk about conservation of a species, you do really need to know how that local culture interacts with them and what those relationships are if you want to do something that's actually effective. Um, and so from that fellowship um, is sort of where my most long-term project came out of. Um, and this is my work as a National Geographic Young Explorer. Um, this is in the Azores, which are Portuguese islands. And so, um, as just said in my intro, my, my work there has been about documenting the stories of former whalers. And so uh, the Azores are a really interesting case because they started whaling there uh, in the 1800s, um, but they only stopped whaling uh, just in the mid 1980s. So right around the year that I was born is actually when they stopped whaling, uh, which is pretty recent. Um, and, but most importantly within that, they never changed the way that they hunted whales in all that time. And so they were still going out with these little seven man wooden canoes um, and hunting sperm whales in a way that anyone else who, who hunted that way had stopped well over a hundred years ago. And so these are the kind of the last people around who can speak to, to that experience um, and who were really dependent uh, in a small remote island on that being, uh, you know, their livelihood. Um, and so I've collected the stories of, of these people who were, who were whalers, um, but I've also been looking at those transitions. So now that whaling has ended, what's happening now? Um, how does culture stay intact or how does it uh, change? Um, and so one of the main ways uh, that I've looked at that is through the boats themselves, through the whale boats. Um, and while they're not being used to hunt whales anymore, uh, they're used now a lot by the younger generation people who are more like my age um, for, for sport. They use them to, to sail and to row, um, and it's the first time that uh, women really have a place in these boats. Uh, this is the women's rowing team, um, and this is me out. Um, I'm steering in the back there in this picture. Um, this is out with the sailing team, and so uh, looking at uh, looking at this, these changes over time as whaling has ended, whale watching has kind of replaced it there. So you still have that connection to the whale, but it's different. Um, and so uh, I was just back uh, in the fall uh, for another couple months to continue work on this project, but it's been about 10 years now overall that I've been, been working here on this. Um, and so when I finished um, sort of that first leg of work as a National Geographic Explorer, um, and I had that experience um, from my fellowship and from my work with gorillas, I really realized that I had done a lot of, a lot of this exploration um, on my own um, and that I, I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to uh, get a, more education on these issues. I wanted to develop new skill sets and a new community around scientists who are working in this field. And so I did get to go to a program that specifically focused on, on that relationship between human health, animal health, and environmental health. Um, and even though I'm a photographer, I'm also a scientist, but I, those things are, are closely related to me. Um, I knew that going to graduate school for, for more science would ultimately also be good for me as a photographer um, because it changes the way that I understand these issues. It changes the way I can see stories and can shoot stories. Um, it just gives me a unique perspective among, um, among other photographers who are out there. And so I saw this as sort of a, a beneficial move for me to be able to to share these stories better with people who weren't scientists by, by understanding that science better myself too. Um, and so I've worked uh, in that field ever since I finished school, which was about five years ago now. Um, and it's taken me to a lot of different places, a lot of different interesting projects. Um, I won't go through them all so as not to, to do too, too many crazy things here, but um, a few of the ones that uh, I'll share with you guys, some of the things I've worked on. Um, uh, this image here kind of talks about uh, the relationship between kids who grow up with livestock, so um, goats or cows, 
sheep, uh, pigs, chickens, um, whatever it is, um, kids who have a lot of close relationship with, with livestock and how that um, might impact uh, nutrition as a child. Um, so these are all things in the end that sort of look at um, both the benefits and the potential risks of, of having close relationships with animals, either through home or through work or through community. So we do some work um, looking at people who, who do work very closely with animals, such as on farms um, or in parks. Um, you know, like what would, what would it be like if your job every day was to drive a banana cart and feed a bunch of monkeys? Um, and uh, just as a little, not my best image, but I did want to share a little bit behind the scenes with you guys too, that it's not always super glamorous to be uh, uh, in the field working on these things because sometimes uh, things happen like a, a monkey will get really aggressive and trap you in a house uh, while destroying all of your day's work by looking for food and just ripping up all of your surveys and opening your samples and dumping them out in the street and doing all sorts of crazy things. So uh, this is some, uh, some of the reality of being out there as well. Um, and then another way that I, I look at these issues is um, sometimes more through, through social issues. So I have a long-term project here in Seattle where I live that looks at the importance of the relationship with animals uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness. So uh, what does that bond with an animal look like uh, when you're struggling through a hard time? Um, for any of you guys who have dogs or, or cats at home, you might know what I'm talking about. We call this the human animal bond and it's that kind of special friendship that you can have with an animal and the way that they just kind of make you feel better um, when you're with your dog. Um, and so I look at that, um, that issue here, and that's something that has um, developed in a way that's really important to me as a photographer, too, to not just take uh, beautiful pictures that people want to look at, but then kind of forget about pretty soon after. Um, it's important to me to use, um, to use photography as a way to engage people more deeply in issues that are affecting their communities, either social or environmental. And so what I've done with this project is, is build a platform. This is a screenshot from the website that I've built from it. Um, and it's a place where community members can go and, and get to know someone, hear the story from someone who's in their community who's experiencing homelessness with an animal. Um, I uh, have pages that sort of talk more about community engagement, the ways that this project partners with organizations who are working to provide uh, but veterinary services, medical services, um, different things like that. So, so you can see sort of how we're combining photography with things that are actually happening um, in the community. Um, resources page, so if you were working with someone who's homeless or uh, were experiencing homelessness yourself, there could be some resources for you to know uh, what services were available to you um, living with your animal. Um, and so for me, this has been a, a, an important way of, of taking it a step further with photography. Um, and I've also built this into sort of a, it's a three class session that I help teach at the University of Washington um, about this, this topic. And so for me, that's, that's where it's really important is sort of merging uh, science and research and education and visual storytelling and photography. So those things um, are really what I strive to do with my work. Um, and before we go into Q&A, I'll just share one more thing, um, something that I've been interested in um, and worked on a bit here and there over the past decade or so um, is looking at plastics pollution. And I think that's something that a lot of folks know about, um, but we don't necessarily always frame it as an issue um, one of these one health or eco health issues that's the field that I work in, which it really is because it does, it's bad for ocean health, it's bad for the animals that live in the ocean, but it's also not great for human health um, because so much of the world depends on things that live in the ocean for food or for work and, and plastics pollution is really impacting that. And so it's something that we have to think of again, where we're all connected and think of solutions in that way. And one of the things that I have really enjoyed about um, about being part of this work is that I've been able to do a lot of it um, as a citizen science scientist, actually. So it's not been my, my main work, but it's something where there are a lot of um, programs where even if you're not a scientist, you can get involved and you can help people um, collect data for their research, or you can even just do beach cleanups um, and help with that pollution in that way too. 
Um, and so as an adventurer, there are different different programs uh, where scientists need data from places that it might be hard to get to otherwise. And so as an adventurer, you can help um, get them some of that data. You can get them samples from the places that you go and help out with that research. Um, and so um, this is just an issue that uh, I've tried to, to work on here and there throughout my life in that way. Um, and also through photography, you can see here, this is, um, if you can't see, you can pick out, there's a, a, a dead seabird here in this mess of plastic. Um, I shot this this fall in Portugal um, to just really talk about the issue uh, through, through my photography as well as my work that I can do by helping out uh, as a citizen scientist. Um, and uh, it does really come full circle for me, uh, all of my worlds, um, you know, I, I went out to sort of get that nature fix um, and share my love of the outdoors um, this fall when I was in Portugal and I climbed the, the highest peak in Portugal, which is the volcano. Um, and you can see the clouds are way down below me on the island, so I'm up pretty high. Um, and I got to the summit of this mountain and there was a plastic straw um, up there. And um, so for me, again, this is where kind of all of my worlds come together. Um, and I know that it might seem like I talked about a lot of different things today, but for me that diversity is really important because um, it's, these aren't just, this isn't just an issue in one place uh, or in one community or with one species um, in the world. These relationships exist between people, animals, and the environment in all different kinds of ways, um, and it's a global issue, and that diversity helps to show that it is a global issue, and of course, it might take uh, might take different forms, or it might look like different things in different parts of the world. Um, but ultimately, um, it's my work to sort of show what these different issues are and ways that people are approaching it in, in innovative ways around the world. And to use my background as a scientist, but my voice as a photographer and a storyteller to sort of bridge those bridge those gaps to cross those disciplines and engage community in in these issues um so i'm going to stop sharing here and uh i think we'll open it up for q a all right Janina, thank you so much for sharing with us um before we do start the q a i have a, a question for you about being a national geographic young explorer yeah how, how old were you when you uh, received your first grant from national geographic I was 25 when I received my first grant from National Geographic. So it's been going on seven years now. I'm a National Geographic aging explorer these days. Aging, think, aging young explorer. <laughs> I think at this stage, you could just be a National Geographic explorer. So I that think you've earned your stripes. <laughs> I think that works. Uh, awesome. Well, that's something for our students to think about is, um, you know, as you're going through high school and starting university, this might be a path that you might want to take. The National Geographic does offer some really great early career grants uh, to get projects yeah. started. So definitely something to keep on the back burner. Absolutely. Uh, all right, let's meet some classrooms. So let's start off. Let's go close to me. So only about 20 minutes from me in Kitchener, <laughs> Ontario, here in Canada. We have Mrs. Uh, Goetz, grade five class. Let me turn your microphone on. Oh, there we go. How's it going, grade fives? Great. Yay! How are you? Hi, my name is McKenna. Me and my friend were wondering if she ended up picking up the straw. <laughs> yes, that's a great question. Um, I absolutely picked up the straw. I took a picture. <laughs> I'm famous. Um, I took a picture of it um, so that I could could share what I saw up there and how crazy it was that I found a straw on top of a volcano. Um, but uh, then I picked it up and I packed it out, and um, I yeah. So it's gone. It's not there anymore. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll swing back to your class again. We're going to visit each class once, and then we'll swing back again. So, get another question ready. And I think that's a great, a great point. And it's it's actually kind of scary. Is um, really isn't anywhere you can go where you're not going to find stuff humans have left behind. And you know, yeah. even just sampling in our oceans, it's very rare that you're going to come up with a sample of water that has no plastics in it. It's 
getting to be a little scary. It is, yeah. It's uh, we now know that uh, by 2050, so in not too many years now, definitely in your lifetime, kids, that there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish in terms of the weight of of all of it uh, together, and that's just that's just crazy. And so um, it's really good where we can to kind of decrease how much we use these plastics that are disposable because it is really changing our ocean um, and the wildlife that live in it. And again, ultimately us too, um, as we use the ocean too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go now to Mr. Monta Alvelo's, uh, Mr. Montalvo's group. They're grade 12s joining us in Long Beach, California. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade 12s? Good. I got a question. Um, what type of stories do you write from national graphic news? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Um, let me repeat that again. Um, what type of stories do you write from the national, ge national graphic, geographic news? <laughs> um, OK, so what kind of stories do I write for National Geographic? Um, so um, as an explorer, um, it means that it's a little bit different than if I was like a writer for the magazine or something. But so a lot of the, the writing that I was doing while I was out in the Azores doing my, my field work there was sort of writing for, it was writing for their Explorers Journal, which is a platform that they have for people who are their Explorer grantees who are out in the field to sort of uh, share what they're doing and you can join along with them. Um, and then from there, once after my uh, original field work had sort of ended, I got to do more with some of the other uh, digital outlets. So things like National Geographic News to share some of the, the work that I was doing. Um, I recently did something for National Geographic Adventure that was more focused on, on that changing uh, tradition with the whale boats that I was talking about. So that piece was uh, sort of, was just looking at over time, the the changing role of the whale boat in Azorian society, um, and now it being used for sport instead of hunting whales, um, and sort of what an impressive transition that is um, in these communities um, to still have that be important, but have what was previously a very important part of it being the whale no longer there, um, or they're still there, they're just not being hunted. Um, and so uh, sometimes I, I write for them about other things, uh, things like biodiversity and citizen science. Um, and, but yeah, that's, that's sort of most of my work through National Geographic, for writing for National Geographic has been related to my work in the Azores since that's the, the projects they funded for me. All right, great question. Let's go to Mrs. Urban's class now. They're joining us. Let's see. There we go. Chilliwack in British Columbia. And it's a group of grade five and six students. How's it going, BC? Yeah. Excellent. Looks like a nice big group. What's your favorite animal study? Ooh. Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> um, my favorite animal to study. Oh man, you stumped me. The animals that I have spent the most time studying, which probably also means that I'm the most interested in them, <laughs> um, are, are the mountain gorillas. Um, and which is just, uh, it's, it's a really incredible experience to, to see them. And, um, to, to sort of recognize some of, you know, the, the faces that they make and the way that they interact with each other. And they're just so huge um, and really special creatures to be around. Um, but I've also spent a lot of time working with whales. Um, there are certain whale species that I uh, enjoy maybe a little bit more than others. Um, southern right whales in particular are probably my favorite species to, to watch. Um, and they, I spend a lot of time with them in, in South Africa and in Argentina, and they're just really fun. Um, they, they're super curious, and they kind of want to come check you out and get close, and they're very playful. Um, and all different species of whales have pretty different personalities, actually. And, um, and so that species has been one that I've had a lot of fun spending time with because they're really fun. 
All right. Before we jump to our next classroom, I just want to give a reminder, anybody who is watching on YouTube, if you're in a classroom, uh, let us know who you are and where you're watching from in the chat sidebar and send us in a question and we'll probably have time to squeeze something in today. So let's go now. Let's see. Let's go to Benicia, California. We've got a grade five classroom with Mrs. Leong. Let me turn your microphone on. Your microphone on. Hey, boys and girls. Hey, boys and girls. Hi. Go ahead with the question. Go ahead with the question. Um, is there a place that you've never been that you want to explore and study? Yes, there are so many places I have that I want to explore and study. Um, um, I would really love to get to Antarctica. So that's the seventh continent that I have not been to yet. Um, and I'm um, doing what I can to get down there. Um, it's just such a different environment than anything anything that I've seen. Um, but yeah, I love exploration i am curious about everywhere um i think you would be hard pressed to find a place that i i wouldn't want to go and explore and learn more about and that's a good thing to have as a nice long travel bucket list as long as you're checking things off yes <laughs> all right and our final classroom joining us live today is Mrs. Fromm's class they are in rochester minnesota grade five classroom let me turn that volume up how are we doing grade fives how are we doing grade fives Okay, go ahead and ask. Hiking on ground. Have you ever been deep sea diving? Have you ever been deep sea diving? Have I ever what? Have I ever what? Been sea diving. Been sea diving. Been sea diving. Scuba diving? Scuba diving? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I have. Um, yeah. I learned to scuba dive in South Africa, um, and I got a little spoiled because the water there is pretty warm where I was. I was in the northeast part of the country, and it's the Indian Ocean there, and it's it's really nice, warm water. And so I worked for a dive company out there for a little while, um, and uh, got to go on lots of dives every day. And uh, it's so cool underwater. There's so many incredible animals down there. It's such a different feeling. Um, and But then I got a little scared because it's really cold water where I live now. And so I have to get over that probably to go diving, but because um, it is it's something that I love and I want to do. But yeah, I think I got a little a little chickened out by how cold the water is because I got spoiled when I was learning. So, But yeah, it's really awesome and you should try it someday. Oh, you got to try some cold water diving. I know, I know, Joe. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to cut a hole in the ice and, exactly. and go. Oh. All right, awesome. Well, let's swing through and let's visit our classrooms again. So, oh, whoops, I muted myself. Uh, what I was trying to say was we lost Mrs. Uh, for a moment, but they were able to get back in. Uh, if you guys have a question, go ahead. Hi, I'm Aaliyah, and I'm wondering Aaliyah, biggest inspiration. Mm. Um, my biggest inspiration, um, is my mother. Um, she has always, um, it just supported me in every way with with helping me develop my curiosity and uh, my love for adventure. Um, she is about to be 65, and she and I still go on backpacking trips together every single year, um, at least once. Um, and that's just uh, her love for, for exploration and adventure, um, particularly in the outdoors um, and in the mountains or in the desert. Um, I grew up in the desert in New Mexico, and um, that's just always been an inspiration to me to see that that's continued for her for so much of her life. And um what she's given me through through teaching me about um being in those spaces and in our relationship together sharing that um and 
Uh, there are also, uh, there are also um, you know, lots of photographers and scientists who have have pushed mm -hmm. me along the way. Um, teachers I've worked with. Um, I think I've I've been fortunate okay. to have a lot of wonderful people um, help me along um, this this journey. Um, and, but yeah, it all kind of. Um, all kind of started with, with my mom um, I wouldn't be nearly as curious or feel like I it was okay to be as curious and be as nerdy um, and as excited about the world as I am if I didn't have that that support from her and from, uh, from teachers and others along the way too so. excellent uh, let's jump back to Mr. Uh, Montalvo's group of grade 12 so your microphone's on again Hi, my name is Chloe. First off, Hi, my I'm Chloe. Chloe. First thank off, you I'm thank you for coming out and talking to us. For coming out and talking to us. Thank you. Um, my question, my question is actually for um traveling for um traveling to the countries. countries. Exactly is your exactly is your partner and travels with you and travels with you. Um, that's a great question. So, um, so, um, yeah, I, yeah, I often, uh, often I'm alone. Um, I'm alone. Um, and um, it's something that I uh, certainly I, I write about, and some of my, you know some of my stories are very much focused on um, both being a woman adventurer. Um, I, I focus on that specifically when I talk about what it's like to be outside as a woman and um, and adventuring as a woman. Um, but I think about it a lot in terms of of traveling as well. Um, and then particularly because I do a lot of my adventures on my own, I do them solo. I go out into the mountains by myself. Um, I go traveling to other countries by myself. Um, and uh, I think that there are really wonderful things about going out there on my own. Um, and sure, sometimes it's, it's a little bit scarier, but um, I also grow a lot more from it to have that time on my own. Um, uh, but I also love traveling with people um, and sharing those adventures with people. And so um, sometimes uh, if I, if when I am traveling with others, um, if I'm, if it's outdoors, uh, it's often friends, friends or my mother um, for going backpacking and hiking and stuff like that. Um, internationally, um, it's usually uh, people that I work with. Um, so, uh, maybe other scientists, maybe other photographers or writers. Um, I do, I do a lot of traveling through my work, uh, with National Geographic student expeditions. So I've been a trip leader and photography teacher for them, um, since 2010. And so I teach, uh, I teach teenagers. I teach folks in high school like yourself um, uh, about photography and exploration on these trips. And so sometimes uh, when I'm traveling, I'm, I'm in that environment with, with other leaders that I'm working with and with students. Um, and so, yeah. So uh, I think it's definitely different experiencing the world um, uh, as a solo female adventurer and traveler. Um, but and I think there's some really wonderful aspects about it. Um, and yeah, maybe sometimes a little riskier as aspects about it, but in the end, I love it and I'm never gonna stop doing it. And um, I think traveling with people and, and with just yourself is, is really special and important. All right, great question. Mrs. Urban's class, your microphone is on again. Where is your favorite place that you have gone so far? Ah, this question always gets me too. Um, um, ah, there are just so many, so many amazing places in the world. Um, I think one of the places that I was just like had my jaw dropped the most um, was when I got to spend some time traveling in Namibia um, in Southern Africa. Um, it was just a part of the world that um, everything was just huge and, and beautiful and uh, it's 
It's the second least densely populated country in the world, which means that there's not a lot of people there. Um, and so it was just a very different experience um, of traveling in a country and, and it was just stunning. Um, but I think uh, in the end, every single place that I travel to has kind of been my favorite place for a different reason. So um, like my favorite food is in Italy. Um, that like if I just went there, there, I would be happy to eat and do nothing else and I don't feel that way about all the places that I go to um, and other places the, the the natural environment is really uh, incredible and breathtaking and that can be my favorite part other places uh, the social environment the people there I feel really welcome and um, and at home in those places like places like the Azores where I've, I've been to a lot of times I, I kind of have a new home over there now um, and so uh, yeah, I think there's there's something special and unique that I could could say is my favorite about every place. Um, at the end of the day. All right, we're heading back to uh, Mrs. Leong's class now, and your microphone is on. You, microphone is on. Hello. Oh. I can we can hear you. It's your turn, yeah. It's your turn, yeah. My question is, do you have a favorite picture that you've taken? Hmm. Um, um, photography is really interesting. I think, well, anything really creative. Um, anything creative. That... Um, uh, it can sometimes be really hard to, to judge your own work because um, so much of what was happening in that moment for you just as a person really impacts um, impacts how you feel about your images. And it's hard to separate that um, that emotion of what you were experiencing and that from, from the final image. And that's why we have other people look at our, our work because they don't have that understanding of what we were feeling while we were taking the picture. Um, but for me, um, some of my favorite images are, are those ones that were um, really important times for me in other ways. Um, yeah, just in what was going on outside of the picture um, or what was going on in, in my mind um, or my heart or whatever else I was experiencing. And so some of those moments that... Uh, just sort of make me drop my jaw. Um, those have kind of turned into to some of my favorite pictures because of that too. And so there's one that I really love. Um, it's actually the main picture you see when you go to my website. Um, but it's of light coming through um, towards the end of the day, close to sunset through the clouds. A storm has just finished um, and it's over the ocean um, at one of my favorite beaches here in Washington. Um, and that uh, that moment was kind of a, a difficult time in my life. Um, but I was there with my mom and um, it was just a really special moment to be there sharing that with her and listening to the ocean um, and watching the light change. Uh, the way that light works after a storm is like so cool. Um, and so just for me, having all of that wrapped into it, that's made it a really uh, a favorite image of mine. Um, but yeah, sometimes it can be hard for us to separate what we really love about our work um, because we're so tied into some of those other other aspects of our own lives with it. So, but that, that's a favorite for sure. All right, and one more trip uh, to Mrs. Fromm's class. Your microphone is now on. Colin, come up. Hi. Hi. What kind of data you collect? You collect. <laughs> um, um, so, so a lot of what my my work, well, my work, well, really what I collect a lot really of is poop, actually. Actually, <laughs> um, a 
and um, that tells um, us a lot. Us I, I collect poop lot. from humans and poop from gorillas and from, from dogs and cows and chickens, and um, it tells us a lot about various things that we're interested in from from looking at it, uh, both from a health and disease standpoint. So sometimes, um, like when I was collecting poop from gorillas, it was to look at certain diseases that they were getting. Um, uh, so if, if you have a tummy bug, um, that can can get to the gorillas and then you can find it in, in their poop. And so I was testing, I was developing a way for, for people there to test um, what diseases are present through that. And then you can do the same thing. You can look for, for things like parasites. Um, like little eggs or worms or different things that might be in there. Um, but another reason that we collected is to look at something called the gut microbiome. And so the our microbiome just talks about the bacteria that live on us and in us. And we're actually, we're actually, if you can believe it, there are more cells on, that are bacteria than our human cells in us. Um, so we have a really important relationship with the bacteria that live with us and they do really great things for us most of the times and then sometimes every so often there's a bad one which is when we study the disease part but we also get that poop too to look at how that whole ecology of the different bacteria that lives in our stomachs what it looks like um, and how that's related to animals that we live close to and what that might mean for our health because uh, how diverse how many different types of bacteria we have um, has implications for our health. It has implications for things like allergy and weight gain and uh, heart health and all sorts of different things. Um, and so uh, it's not everybody likes to talk about poop all the time, but that is that is one thing that uh, I do collect a lot of um, to learn about the, the work that I do. All right. Well, it's all important things, and I, I'm happy you brought up the the microbiome in your gut and on your body. We had uh, when I was in the classroom, we had a, a professor come in and teach us about that when we were studying biodiversity. And we did an experiment where we swabbed our fingers, and then the students swabbed their cell phones, and then grew uh, both cultures, and then you could match up the cell phone user to the person because everybody's uh, biome the bacteria they're carrying is unique so it's almost like a fingerprint it's pretty pretty darn cool yeah it is yeah. All right. Well, Jamina, thank you so much. That was a great right. hangout. It was great to catch up and, and hear a little bit about uh, your journeys and what you're up to. And I think the classrooms had a good time. They all had really great questions today. So, boys and girls, thank you so much. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to turn the microphones on, let them say goodbye and thank you. But again, thanks so much. And uh, we look forward to whatever's coming next. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This has been wonderful. Uh, and yeah, it's great questions. Great questions. I'm going to have to think about some of those after <laughs> all right well let me turn the microphones on classrooms nice and loud goodbye and thank you and then we'll sign off for today <laughs> All right, they're all really good at that. Uh, thanks everyone for hanging out today. We have a whole bunch of more events celebrating women in science, adventure, exploration, and conservation coming up. Uh, we look forward to seeing you for some more. And once again, Jamina, thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, classrooms. It was great to meet you all. Thank you, Joe. It was great to meet you all.